Hey guys, welcome back to Election Center, and in this video, we're going to be taking a look at landslides in U.S. presidential elections, uh, the different landslides throughout history that have occurred uh, in U.S. presidential elections, where one of the candidates just won by huge margins. Uh, so yeah, in case you guys are wondering, I did make this on Google Slides, so basically, basically on each slide, I put the results of the election, and so yeah, I'll talk about it, and I put them in chronological order. So basically, the election of 1920 would come before the election of 1928, for instance. Uh, uh, but yeah, anyway, you guys might, uh, some of these, uh, maybe a lot of people would consider more just to be decisive victories, uh, maybe not quite landslides, or maybe there are other elections that I did not think were quite large margin enough to be considered landslides that you guys would consider landslides that I just didn't consider landslides. Uh, so there is some wiggle room in terms of what is considered a landslide and what is not considered a landslide. Uh, but yeah, anyway guys, this is just my opinion on the different landslides that have happened throughout history. Uh, so yeah, let's just jump into it here, starting off with the first election here, uh, 1852, Franklin Pierce, the Democrat, versus Winfield Scott of the Whig Party. And by the way, the Whig Party is now no longer an existent political party. Uh, it used to be one of the two major political parties where it was sort of the Democrats versus the Whigs. Uh, but yeah, that that is not a political party anymore. Uh, this might have been the last election where the Whigs actually ran a presidential candidate, I, I, I believe. But anyway, Franklin Pierce versus Winfield Scott. Let's take a look at the results here. Franklin Pierce winning in a landslide, 254 electoral votes. And remember, back then you did not need 270 to win because they were not all 50 states yet. Uh, in the popular vote, he got 1,605,943. That's 50.8%. And he won 27 states. And then let's take a look over here at Winfield Scott. He got just 42 electoral votes. In the popular vote, he got 1,386,418. 43.9%, so sizably behind Pierce in the popular vote as well, and he won just four states. So yeah, Franklin Pierce winning in kind of a little big landslide here. Uh, you know what, in this election, the Whig party was badly divided, and that really hurt Winfield Scott. He, you know, he failed with Whig voters in the South, but then also he failed with the Whig voters in the North just because of different divisions in the party. Uh, so yeah, this was a big landslide, Franklin Pierce uh, easily beating Winfield Scott in 18, 1852. Moving on to 1864, this is an interesting one because, uh, you know, a lot of people maybe would say this doesn't really count because uh, we see all these southern states here not voting, not participating in the election due to uh, reasons uh, involving the Civil War. Uh, so, yeah, those Confederate states not participating in this election. Uh, so, you know, Democrats would do better in the South uh, during this time, so, you know, maybe George McClellan could have actually even won. At the very least, it would have been a lot closer, probably, if those Confederate states were voting in the election. But, uh, yeah, you know, uh, a landslide is a landslide, whether or not, uh, certain states are participating. And if you look at the results here, Lincoln won 22 states, Abraham Lincoln of the National Union Party, which was basically the Republican Party, they changed their name for this election, uh, to win over, uh, more voters, and then George McClellan, the Democrat, he won just three states. So if you ask me, uh, a landslide is a landslide any way, uh, you, any way you put it. So Abraham Lincoln here winning 212 electoral votes uh, in the popular vote, 2,211,317, 55%, and he won 22 states. And then George McClellan, winning just 21 electoral votes in the popular vote, 1,806,227, 45%, and he won th uh, just three states, Kentucky, Delaware, and New Jersey. So yeah, I, I, I still consider this a landslide, even though we do have that uh, factor of those southern states, or a lot of those southern states not voting or not participating in the election. But yeah, you know, Lincoln was heavily popular with soldiers soldiers voting for him and then recommending them back to back to their family back home and you know there were a lot of other reasons too the union with some big military victories that really helped lincoln win this election so yeah 1864 22 to 3 states 1872 ulysses s grant republican versus horace greeley who was nominated by the democratic party as well as 
the newly formed Liberal Republican Party. So they both nominated him. I have him in purple for the Liberal Republican Party. So yeah, Ulysses S. Grant, 286 electoral votes. In the popular vote, 3,597,439, 55.6% winning 29 states. And then let's look over here at Horace Greeley. Just 66 electoral votes. In the popular vote, 2,833,710, 43.8%, 12 points almost. It looks like 11.8 behind Grant, and he wins just six states. So, you know, Horace Greeley, not a good campaigner. He was a newspaper editor. Greeley did have some odd positions uh, during his days as a newspaper editor that the Republicans could attack. Uh, you know, just such a long history, so much dirt to dig up on Greeley, uh, so many weird takes he had as a newspaper editor, and, you know, there were other factors too, and Grant winning in a big landslide, 29 to 6 states, but uh, yeah, that's 1872. Moving on to 1904, Theodore Roosevelt, Republican versus Alton B. Parker, Democrat. So yeah, this is a landslide where Alton B. Parker does not win outside of the South. Uh, he did get some electoral votes in Maryland, actually, I think he got more than Roosevelt because of, you know, just some weird uh, reasoning with the electors, the way the Electoral College worked uh, in that state, something with the electors there. Uh, even though Roosevelt barely won the popular vote in Maryland, it was actually an extremely close state that was not called for a super long time. But uh, yeah, for Roosevelt, 336 electoral votes in the popular vote, 7,630,000. 557, 56.4%, and he wins 33 states. And so Alton B. Parker getting actually a respectable 140 electoral votes, but in the popular vote, 5,084,537. That's just 37.6% way behind Roosevelt, and he wins 12 states all in the South, all in that pretty solid Democratic South. Because back during this time, Democrats sort of had a stranglehold on most of these southern states are a lot of these southern states. Uh, so yeah, you know, 140 electoral votes, that's not too bad. 12 states, that's not too bad. But uh, combined with the fact that he was way behind in the popular vote by like 19 points, it looks like, and all of his states, you know, he maybe if he won some of those more competitive states, uh, I don't know, it, maybe if during this time there were some southern states that were competitive and maybe it was something uh, significant that he was able to win there, but all in all... Democrats had a pretty strong hold on the South, and he was only able to win in the South. Everywhere else, it was a Roosevelt sweep, and that's reflected in the popular vote, uh, where he was way behind. Parker was way behind. So yeah, 1904, this is pretty much a landslide, uh, a landslide victory for Roosevelt. But moving on now to 1912, this is a really interesting, because we really have sort of four major... Uh, candidates or four candidates getting more than five percent of the vote so four candidates to cover here but let's start off here Woodrow Wilson the Democrat getting 435 electoral votes in the popular vote he gets 6,294,384 that's 41.8 percent that's less than a majority and we'll get to that part uh, but he wins 40 states uh, so yeah Woodrow Wilson taking the lion's share uh, of of the electoral votes here uh, but Theodore Roosevelt now running under the Progressive Party. Theodore Roosevelt had already been president, but uh, you see here the Republican nominee, William Howard Taft, he had been Roosevelt's vice president. They were both Republicans, remember. But Roosevelt did not really like the job Taft was doing, sort of maybe straying too far from the philosophy of Roosevelt. And so Roosevelt challenged Taft to the Republican nomination. He won the primaries, but lost because of, you know, the delegates... Uh, back then, I think it was mostly more just decided by the delegates as opposed to people voting, and then the delegates are pledged. Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt here. So he ran under the new progressive party that was formed for his run. Uh, and so we really see the Republicans splitting the vote a lot. So yeah, that's a big part of this uh, Republican vote split. But uh, Theodore Roosevelt, I have his name in green, but uh, on the electoral map, those states in yellow, those are Roosevelt states. Sorry if that's confusing. Just to clarify... While I do have his name in green, those states in yellow, those are states that were run won by Roosevelt. Uh, but yeah, Roosevelt got 88 electoral votes, 4,121,609 votes in the popular vote. That's 27.4%, and he wins six states. And so now the person he's really splitting the vote with, William Howard Taft, current president, he wins just two states. He's the Republican. He wins two states, Utah and Vermont. 
8 electoral votes and the popular vote 3,487,939, And then Eugene E. Debs here, Socialist Party candidate, he does not have enough support in one particular state to win any states or electoral votes, but uh, in the popular vote he gets 900,743 votes, so that's 6%. Uh, so yeah, really what we see in this election is Roosevelt and Taft splitting the Republican vote. Uh, we see Roosevelt coming out maybe significantly stronger, but uh, still splitting that vote, and then that allows Woodrow Wilson to just cruise on to victory with the Democrats uh, united behind him. Uh, he's not splitting the vote with some other candidate taking votes from the Democrats. So yeah, you know, you know Roosevelt was famous. He was very popular, but uh, really we see the Republican vote getting split. I feel like maybe Eugene E. Debs was also kind of splitting the vote with Roosevelt a bit, because uh, they were both kind of, uh, you know, anti-monopoly. They both were kind of uh, that type of, you know, for the working man, sticking, sticking up for the working man, uh, not liking big business, big money monopolies and that sort of thing. They were, you know, uh, Eugene E. Debs is socialist. And then Roosevelt, progressive president, he, you know, he uh, was anti-monopoly. He broke up monopolies, that sort of thing. But yeah, really just a lot of vote splitting in this election. This is just sort of the ultimate vote splitting election. Uh, with Taft and Roosevelt splitting that Republican vote, just allowing Wilson to cruise on to victory, winning 40 states of the 48 states. Alaska and Hawaii are not yet states. But uh, yeah, that's 1912. Moving on here to 1920, Will Warren G. Harding, uh, the Republican, versus James M. Cox, who was obliterated by Harding. I mean, look at this. Harding, 404 electoral votes, 16,166,000. 126 in the popular vote, that many votes, and that's 60.4%. He wins 37 states. Let's look over here at Cox, his stats. 127 electoral votes, and the popular vote way behind at 9,140,256, 34.1%. That's, you know, more than 26% behind, 26.3% it looks like. He wins just 11 states all in the South, where, you know, that was sort of where the Democrats had a stranglehold. He can't even win Tennessee. But this is a huge landslide. So way behind in the popular vote, winning all of his electoral votes from the South. Uh, you know, part of this was Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic president, who had, he was the current president at this time. He was incredibly xenophobic. He said very horrible things about Irish Americans and German American xenophobic thing, and uh, that definitely probably turned away these voters from the Democratic Party. And uh, so, for instance, at this time, I believe there were a lot more German speaking, uh, a larger percentage of the population spoke German during this time, and there was a lot of German language press, and they all endorsed Harding. So he got the German American vote, and I think the Irish American vote, maybe out of anger towards Wilson didn't show up to vote but uh, yeah there was that factor going towards Harding and he won all of the big cities pretty much he just uh, did really well in the cities and we see Cox losing in a big landslide winning all of his electoral votes from that Democratic South not winning any in any other region and way behind in the popular vote so yeah that's 1920 big landslide for Harding 1924 we have Calvin Coolidge who inherited the presidency when Harding passed away. He was vice president under Harding. He gets 382 electoral votes, 15,719,068 votes in the popular vote. That's 54%. And he wins 35 states. John W. Davis, the Democrat, he gets 136 electoral votes, 8,384,341 in the, uh, that many votes in the popular vote, 28.8%. And he wins 12 states, all in the South, or Oklahoma is... He wins Oklahoma, uh, but other than that, all from the South where, as we've discussed, the Democrats had a stranglehold on that region. And then Robert M. La Follette uh, of the Progressive Party, he wins 13 electoral votes. Uh, I do have, once again, I have that mismatch of the name color and uh, the color I have filled in on the map. Apologies about that. I have his name in gray, but that yellow state up there, that's his home state of Wisconsin, and he wins that state. So 13 electoral votes from his home state of Wisconsin. He came close in, I think, a couple other states. He just couldn't quite get to the point of winning them outright. And he got 
4 million 833,821 in the popular vote 16.6 percent so yeah just winning that one state uh so yeah calvin coolidge way ahead of the uh, the rest of the pack here john w davis davis and robert m la follette calvin coolidge he gained public confidence uh with some things he did uh the public had confidence in coolidge here john w davis uh, maybe there was some vote splitting with the fallout, but we see Calvin Coolidge still well over 50% here with 54%. Uh, so, you know, and it's not necessarily, you know, I, I don't even think probably the fallout would have taken necessarily more from Davis, but we see still, you know, Calvin Coolidge well over 50%. That's a majority with 54%. But uh, yeah, big landslide in 1924 uh, with John W. Davis way behind in the popular vote. And then Robert M. LaFalla third party candidate quite strong considering he's not one of the two major parties but way behind the rest of the pack here only winning in his home state of wisconsin he came close in a couple of the states i think at winning uh but yeah he he just couldn't quite clinch those states so yeah that's 1924 moving on to 1928 herbert hoover wins in a landslide against al smith so Herbert Hoover, 444 electoral votes, 21,428,584 votes in the popular vote. That's 58.2%, and he wins 40 states. And then Al Smith over here uh, with 87 electoral votes. In the popular vote, he gets 15,015,863. That's 40.1%, and he wins just eight states. So we see Herbert Hoover here sweeping every region except... Uh, Al Smith is able to win uh, one, two, three, four, five states in the South, uh, and then two New England states, I think by narrower margins, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Uh, but some of these uh, southern states, actually, Al Smith got, you know, like over 90%. So some of these states he did do extremely well, just a couple of these super solid Democratic southern states. But, uh, you know, Herbert Hoover actually narrowly beat Al Smith in Al Smith's own home state of New York. So Al Smith couldn't even win his home state of New York. Uh, if he had won New York, maybe uh, this would be not quite so much of a landslide. It would have been 39 states to, uh, to 9 states. Herbert Hoover, uh, Al Smith would have gotten, you know, maybe I think 132 electoral votes if I'm doing my math right. I'm just real quickly doing the math here in my head. But uh, yeah. You know, Al Smith, Catholic, he actually, that was sort of, that did actually kind of harm his campaign because there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment and there were actually some sort of conspiracy theories surrounding him that, like, the Pope, if Al Smith got elected, would come and rule the the United States from a fortress. Some some wacky conspiracy theories like that that would surround Al, Al Smith. So, yeah, Al Smith, the, the, the Catholic, the fact that he was Catholic, that it actually... That was a hindrance to his campaign, but, uh, yeah, it was a big landslide for Herbert Hoover because of that factor, and also probably just because of other factors, maybe Al Smith just was not a strong candidate, but yeah, big landslide, 40 of the 48 states going for Hoover, and he wins strongly in the popular vote, 18.1%, but yeah, that's 1928. Moving on, though, Herbert Hoover this time in 1932 would be the one losing in a landslide in his re-election bid to FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt wins in a landslide over Hoover Hoover with 472 electoral votes. In the popular vote, he gets 22,821,513. That's 57.4%. And he wins 32 states. Let's look at Hoover's stats over here. Just 59 electoral votes. Way down from the 442 last time. 15,761,532 in the popular vote, 39.7%, and he wins just six states. So this was during the Great Depression, which uh, at the time, Hoover just was not uh, handling well. It was just getting worse, and Herbert Hoover, he would try to do things, and they just wouldn't stop the crisis. And uh, I think at one point, he actually just decided that there was nothing that could be done. Herbert Hoover decided that about the Great Depression, uh, but F FDR, he's proposing, you know, the, the New Deal uh, solutions to the Great Depression, and, uh, you know, if you're the incumbent president and you're not able to respond effectively to the Great Depression, uh, to the, maybe one of the, uh, the biggest economic downturns, uh, at least of, for sure, of the 20th, 20th century, right, then you're not going to get reelected, and so, yeah, Herbert Hoover, he loses in a big landslide to FDR in 1932. But, uh, yeah, that's 1932. Moving on to FDR's re-election bid. 
1936 against Republican Alf Landon. It's a way even bigger yet still landslide. So let's look at the stats here. FDR, 523 electoral votes, 27,757,431 in the popular votes. That's 60.8%. That's how many votes he gets. And he wins 46 states. So let's look at Alf Landon here. He gets just a paltry eight electoral votes. And uh, in the popular vote, he gets 16,683,574. That's 36.5%. So behind FDR in the popular vote, by 20.3%. He wins just two states, Vermont and Maine. So, you know, Alf Landon, uh, I don't think he campaigned aggressively. I think he was kind of out of the spotlight, uh, reclusive. Uh, and uh, he tried to launch some attacks on Roosevelt that just did not gain traction, uh, saying that Roosevelt was, you know, doing power grabs, turning the United States into a dictatorship. These types of things just really didn't gain traction. And Alf Landon lost in a big landslide, and I believe the economy was recovering at this point. So, you know, FDR uh, winning in a humongous landslide against Alf Landon in 1936, one of the biggest landslides in American history. And then, but FDR in 1940 runs again. Remember, presidents were not limited to two terms yet. And he wins in a third landslide. Republicans gaining ground, actually, though, with uh, their nominee, Wendell Wilkie, uh, you know, not as decisive of a victory for FDR as in 1936. It shows that the Republicans are starting to gain back some ground, but it's still a huge margin enough to be a landslide. So let's look at the stats here. FDR, 449 electoral votes. In the popular vote, 27,314,449. And he gets 54.7% of the popular vote, and he wins 38 states. And then let's look at Wendell Wilkie over here. He gets 82 electoral votes, far behind, but a lot better than Alf Landon. And in the popular vote, he gets 22,348,343. That's 44.8% of the popular vote. So that's a less than 10-point difference. That's a 9.9% difference. And he wins 10 states. They're able to get 10 states. So a lot more respectable performance by Wendell Wilkie than we saw by Alf Landon in 1936. Uh... So he's able to hold on to Vermont and Maine, the two states Alf Landon won in 1936, the Landon two. <laughs> I'm just going to call them that. Uh, and he's able to pick up eight other states. So let's look at this. Uh, Michigan, big electoral vote to- prize, 19 electoral votes. Indiana, Iowa, the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado. Uh, some solid wins by the GOP here, but uh, not nearly enough to get to required number of electoral votes, not enough to unseat FDR, and he wins by, uh, FDR wins by a strong margin in the popular vote here in 1940, uh, so yeah, FDR winning a third term, once again, by strong margins, and then in 1944, uh, this was Roosevelt, he was able to win another time, uh, a fourth term, uh, he would die in office during this term, uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, he was getting older at that point, but, uh, Looking at the electoral vote here, 432 electoral votes for FDR, uh, and then in the popular vote, 25,612,916, that's 53.9%, and he wins 36 states. And then his Republican opponent, Thomas E. Dewey, who would run after this election in 1948 and lose in an upset uh, against Harry Truman, who uh, would be, be FDR's vice president, inherit the presidency when FDR dies, run in 1948, be expected to lose uh, against Thomas E. Dewey, and then he's in an upset victory, wins against Thomas E. Dewey. But, uh, yeah, before 1948, uh, Thomas E. Dewey, he ran against FDR in 1940, and he got 99 electoral votes, 22,017,929 in the popular vote. That's how many votes he got, and that's 45.9%. And he wins 12 states. So he picks up Ohio. Uh, that's a big electoral vote twi- prize, 25 electoral votes. Uh, lo- loses Michigan, it looks like. And he holds on to the land in two, Vermont and Maine. Uh, so, yeah. Once again, Republicans gaining ground, but it's just not enough. Uh, Losing still by solid margins in the popular vote. What's that? Eight-point margin in the popular vote. And big time in the Electoral College. They win 12 states. 
uh, but then look at some of these states. A lot of these are more uh, less populated, sparser states. It looks like uh, where you know lower numbers of electoral votes. Uh, so yeah, Roosevelt he sort of peaked in 1936, did worse in 1940, worse in 1944, but four straight landslides by FDR. Uh, so then Harry Truman wins in 1948, and in 1952 the Republicans finally win, and it's a landslide. Uh, with Dwight D. Eisenhower, a popular World War II general, as their nominee, winning in a landslide against Adlai Stevenson. Uh, so let's look at this here. 442 electoral votes for Ike. Uh, 34,075,529 in the popular vote. That's 55.2%. By the way, Ike, that's that's Dwight D. Eisenhower. His slogan was, I, I like Ike. <laughs> so I'm calling him Ike. But, uh, and he won 39 states. And then Adlai Stevenson over here, 89 electoral votes, 27,375,090 votes. That's 44.3% in just nine states. Looks like all they're all in the South. So, uh, yeah, I think Adlai Stevenson was expected to do better than this. Uh, you know, there was a Gallup poll, I do believe, that came out uh, before the election that showed just a couple of points between them. Dwight D. Eisenhower leading Adlai Stevenson, like, 51 to 49, something like that. So, uh, it was expected to be a lot closer, I think, but it ended up being a landslide for Eisenhower, and he won the popular vote by 10.9%. Uh, you know, I think Adlai Stevenson was expected to do better. Uh, you know, if you watch the election coverage from 1952 that they aired on television, uh, they had sort of this old computer technology that they used to, like, try to predict the election outcome, and it predicted a landslide for Eisenhower, and they thought, wait a minute, this can't be right. So they sort of uh, dismissed it, I think, and, and it turned out to be right. Uh, you know, they thought it was going to be a lot closer, but it ended up being the landslide for Eisenhower. So yeah, Adlai Stevenson, you know, we have Dwight D. Eisenhower, popular World War II general, and then Adlai Stevenson over here, sort of a, you know, I guess you could call him nerdy, right? Uh, intellectual, palsy guy, uh, sort of not really knowing how to talk to the masses in, you know, language that, you know, someone who's not all knowledgeable about policy, mass understandable language that's understood by the masses, he, he just doesn't have that charisma, I guess you could say. And uh, Eisenhower over here, popular World War II general, and I think one of the first campaigns to really court the female vote. Don't really think that happened be too much bef uh, before this. Uh, and then Eisenhower trying to get win with the women voters. And uh, yeah, these factors, this led to a big landslide for Eisenhower in 1952. And then in 1956, we have a rematch uh, in Eisenhower's re-election campaign, Stevenson coming at it for another go. So it's an even bigger landslide this time with Eisenhower, 457 electoral votes and the popular vote, 35,579,180. And that's 57.4%. And then he wins 41 states. Whereas Adlai Stevenson over here, he picks up Missouri, right? That's not, that he he breaks for, out of the South, but then he loses a bunch of other Southern states. But then he loses a bunch of other states here. It looks like uh, he loses some other states. So he ends up just with seventy-three electoral votes. Uh, and in the popular vote, he loses worse than he did in nineteen fifty-two. It's twenty-six million twenty-eight thousand twenty-eight votes for Stevenson. That's forty-two percent. And he wins just seven states, so that's a decrease of two states. Uh, so yeah, I think he picks up Missouri, and then he loses enough states to that to get him down to seven, knock him down. So yeah, 1956, another landslide for Eisenhower. Uh, and then moving on here to 1964. So after 1956, John F. Kennedy beats Richard Nixon, and then John F. Kennedy is assassinated. And LBJ inherits the presidency, and he's running uh, in 1964 against Barry Goldwater here, who they were able to paint as sort of a dangerous extremist type guy. They released, I think it's one of the most well-known campaign ads, sort of implying that Barry Goldwater would lead to some kind of nuclear war. Uh, and they were sort of able to, I think, scare a lot of voters into not voting for Barry Goldwater. But let's look at the results here for LBJ. 486 electoral votes, 43,129,040 votes in the popular vote. That's 61.1%. And he wins 44 states plus D.C. And then Barry Goldwater here with just 52 electoral votes, 
27,175,754 in the popular vote. That's 38.5% way behind LGA, LBJ. And he wins just six states, so his home state of Arizona, and then five southern states. So, yeah, big landslide for LBJ here. Garrett Barry Goldwater was able to do well in the south, it looks like. Uh, one of these states, he got like 82% of the vote or something. But then he lost, it looks like, everywhere else. Uh, so yeah, 1964, big landslide for LBJ. Moving on to 1972, Richard Nixon, his re-election campaign against George McGovern, the Democratic nominee. He wins every state except for Massachusetts, and then he loses that District of Columbia, heavily Democratic. So, look, so let's look at the stats here. For Richard Nixon, 520 electoral votes in the popular vote, 47,168,710. That's 60.7%, and then uh, he wins 49 states. So remember, George McGovern only winning in Massachusetts. And then looking at the uh, George McGovern's stats, just 17 electoral votes in the popular vote, 29,173,222 votes. And that's just 37.5% far behind Nixon, and he's only win able to win that one state, Massachusetts, plus D.C. So, you know... George McGovern had a lot of disasters, sort of. Uh, first off, Thomas Eagleton, his initial uh, vice presidential nominee, uh, they had to drop him. Uh, it was revealed that he had uh, been hospitalized uh, various times and received shock therapy as he had suffered depression throughout his life. Uh, so that was revealed. They didn't think it was going to be a good choice to choose Eagleton that would not come off well. They they just were not able to go with Eagleton, but they had already chosen him. So then they had to figure out another nominee that probably hurt McGovern. And they were, uh, McGovern was also, uh, you know, Nixon, the Republicans, they were able to portray McGovern as sort of an extremist kind of, you know, sort of as LBJ portrayed Goldwater as an extremist when you're able to portray one of these candidates, uh, the, your opponent, as an extremist, it tends to be almost kind of a big landslide, it seems, maybe. Uh, so George McGovern, they uh, it called him and painted him as an extremist, uh, wanted all these super liberal things, uh, radical liberal. Uh, maybe, it, maybe it was, you know, it was, it was pretty, you know, not necessarily the mainstream. Um, but yeah, George McGovern, he lost in a big landslide against, uh, to Richard Nixon. He wasn't even able to win his home state of South Dakota. He lost that by a bit. Big landslide for Richard Nixon in his re-election campaign against George McGovern in 1972. Moving on here to 1980, Jimmy Carter's re-election campaign. He loses in a landslide to Republican Ronald Reagan. And then, of course, we have John B. Anderson, a significant third-party candidate running as an independent. However, John B. Anderson wins no states. He does perform strongly in some, but he does not win outright any states. So looking at the results here, Ronald Reagan... 489 electoral votes, and in the popular vote, he gets 43,903,230 votes. That's 50.8%, and he wins 44 states. So, looking over here at Jimmy Carter, he gets just 49 electoral votes. Uh, in the popular vote, he gets 35,480,115. That's just 41% of the vote, and then he wins 6 states plus D.C. And then John Anderson, he doesn't win any states. Uh, but he gets 5,719,850 votes. That's 6.6% of the vote. John Anderson, I really want to quickly talk about. Uh, earlier on, he was able to get strong support in the polls, you know, almost sort of giving Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter a run for their money. But uh, over time, uh, you know, he, he was a third party, and over time the major party nominees were able to strip back most of that support. Uh, so John B. Anderson dwindled from, you know, in the 20s, uh, you know, t over 20%, maybe in the high 20s at one point in the polls. Uh, and then by election day, he was down at 8%, and then that ended up only being 6.6% of the popular vote. You know, maybe people didn't uh, want to vote for someone who they thought was not a viable candidate or couldn't win. Uh, you know, I think uh, John B. Anderson had his share of maybe small m campaign mistakes that he made. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, Jimmy Carter... You know, this was a time when uh, there was the Iran hostage crisis and the economy was not doing well. There was, you know, oil shocks. People were having to conserve uh, energy usage. Uh, Ronald Reagan was able to win in a landslide. 
you know, Jimmy Carter was just juggling a bunch of things, and he came off as almost, I think, weak, maybe. So, yeah, earlier on, Jimmy Carter was able to take a huge lead in, uh, because of the Iran hostage crisis, uh, where, you know, horrible thing happened, uh, Americans were taken hostage, uh, at the embassy, the U.S. Embassy in Iran, there was a revolution, and it, I guess in the midst of that, uh, there, there was just a lot of U- anti-U.S. sentiment in Iran. Uh, Americans were taken hostage, and so that was a huge thing that was going on in the uh, in the news during this election. And just counting the days that the hostages had been uh, held, and you know, early on there was the rally around the leader effect, which led to a big lead for Carter. But then it dragged on, and it, that ended up going against Carter in the end. Uh, and you know, the economy was not doing well, so this all helped Ronald Reagan. Uh, Carter was only able to win, you know, his home state of Georgia, uh, Minnesota, West Virginia, you know, some of these safe democratic states, Maryland, Rhode Island, Hawaii, and then that district of Columbia. So, yeah, big landslide for Ronald Reagan in 1980. Jimmy Carter, just, you know, many things he could say, he could use to say why you should vote for him, right? He didn't have many cards to play. You know, the economy wasn't doing well. Uh, the hostages had not been freed, uh, you know? Things were not going well in the country. This, this all went against Jimmy Carter. So big landslide. Uh, Ronald Reagan won in a huge landslide in 1980. Uh, but yeah, Ronald Reagan's re-election campaign in 1984, uh, winning in one of the biggest landslides ever against Walter Mondale, who was a vice president under Jimmy Carter. And you know, this time around though, the economy was doing well. Things seemed to be going well in the Reagan presidency. Uh, this this was a huge landslide, and Walter Mondale made some big mistakes. Uh, you know, first off, Reagan uh, was popular. Reagan was widely popular, right? So that's one thing going against Mondale. Two, Mondale was vice president under the Carter administration, which had just lost in a huge landslide. Uh, so, you know... Then they expect to come back and win with Walter Mondale. Maybe he wasn't necessarily the strongest candidate they could have picked. And uh, also, he said at the Democratic convention, uh, you know, he a big issue for him was the deficit, right? The deficit, we've got to solve this deficit, is what he would say. And at his acceptance speech at the Democratic National Convention, he said, we have this deficit, we have to do something about it. I'm just paraphrasing what he said. We have to solve this deficit. We're both going to raise taxes. To solve this deficit. He won't tell you, I just did. So what he's trying to do there is come off as being honest, like, yeah, I'm going to raise taxes, but we're both going to raise taxes. It's just that he won't tell you and I will. Uh, But that just came off as him saying, promising basically as a campaign pledge, I'm going to raise your taxes. You know, I don't think most people will want to hear that. Uh, You know, vote for someone who's just blatantly saying, hello, I'm going to raise your taxes. You know, so that it was probably a critical mistake. He's making this campaign pledge about how he's going to raise taxes to reduce the deficit. Uh, So that's that's hindering him. And then we have the popular Ronald Reagan. So let's talk about the results here. Ronald Reagan, 525 electoral votes, 54 million, 455,472 in the popular vote. That's 58.8 percent. And he wins 49 states. Let's look at Walter Mondale. 13 electoral votes. Uh, in the popular vote, 37,577,352, and that's 40.6%. And he wins just one state, his home state of Minnesota, and then that District of Columbia he also wins, but that's safe, safe, safe Democratic territory. Uh, so yeah, a huge landslide for Ronald Reagan. So yeah, that's 1984. And then 1988... This is the last election we're going to talk about in this video. Uh, You know, some people maybe would not quite consider this a landslide. Uh, We have Republican George H.W. Bush versus Democrat Michael Dukakis. And after two huge landslides, this honestly seems pretty good, right? In 1980, Jimmy Carter getting just 49 electoral votes. In 1984, Walter Mondale getting just 13. And then we have Michael Dukakis here getting 100 and. 
It would have been 112. There was a faithless elector that for some reason voted for Lloyd Benston, who is Dukakis's running mate. But uh, yeah, 112 electoral votes and then 111 because of that faithless elector. But let's look at the results here. For George Bush, it's still a huge margin. 426 electoral votes. And in the popular vote, 48,886,588. That's 53.4%. And he wins 40 states. Looking at Michael Dukakis here, 111 electoral votes. Uh, or I guess it would have been 112 if it weren't for that faithless elector. And in the popular vote, 41,809,485. That's 45.7%. So he loses the popular vote by 7.7%. Uh, and then he wins 10 states plus D.C. So they're able to win uh, the Democrats, Oregon, Washington, Hawaii, Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin. By the way, they won Iowa by a big margin. West Virginia... New York, Massachusetts, Dukakis, Dukakis's home state, and Rhode Island, and then the District of Columbia. That's kind of a given. Uh, so yeah, it seems respectable at first, but then, think about this, coming out of the Democratic Convention, Dukakis had like a 17-point lead over George H.W. Bush uh, in the polls, and then that just evaporated over time to the point where George Bush ended up winning the popular vote by almost 8 points. And he had a substantial lead in the polls. Uh, so uh, what happened was George H.W. Bush, their campaign, and then some people who were just supporters of him, where it wasn't necessarily the Bush campaign, there was a bunch of negative advertising in this election. And uh, the Bush campaign uh, and then the supporters of the Bush campaign, their negative advertising against Dukakis was highly effective. And they were able to make him come off as soft on crime. There's the well-known Willie Horton ad where they talk about uh, some... Uh, criminal uh, people have said this ad was racially charged but uh, there was it was talking about how he had committed crimes and how that was enabled by the prison furlough program I believe it's called uh, that was in, in Massachusetts under Dukakis and I think Dukakis was a supporter of that program uh, but uh, yeah that was an effective advertisement and it was able to portray Dukakis as soft on crime and so, yeah, there was a lot of effective negative advertising or attack advertising against Dukakis. Uh, and then uh, something that's sort of connected to that, there was this horrible photo op that Dukakis did where to come off as sort of tough or seem like he knew what he was doing on the military, he got in a tank and drove around in a tank for a photo op. And then the helmet, you can just see, you know, he looks foolish to be, <laughs> to be honest, right? The helmet, it's way bigger than his head. It, it, it looks way too big on him. And he's just driving around, ridiculous, in this tank. And uh, it was just an embarrassing photo op. And in the Bush campaign, they made this advertisement where they say all of these... They show footage of Dukakis foolishly riding around in the tank uh, where he kind of looks, you know, ridiculous. That's That was the feeling at the time is that he looked ridiculous. And then over the footage of him riding around in the tank, they have all of these things uh, that Dukakis did uh, or like these statements of why Dukakis is uh, bad in terms of the military saying, you know, Dukakis vetoed uh, so-and-so or he said that we should do this for the military. And, you know, I don't remember the specific points they were making, uh, but all these points there's, that are stated by a narrator uh, and then the text is on the screen of things about Dukakis and, the, and his... Uh, why he's not good on the military issue, and then uh, that's overlaid on this footage of Dukakis riding around in the tank, and that was an advertisement they did that I think was effective. Uh, so yeah, this all hurt Dukakis, and then another big thing that happened, uh, he was greatly hurt by an answer he gave in one of the debates where one of the moderators asked, because uh, Dukakis was against the death penalty, and he was asked uh, by a moderator if something... Uh, very horrible was done to his wife. They were more specific, but uh, they, he, he was asked if these, if this horrible thing had been done to his wife and whether or not he would support the death penalty. It was very serious, uh, you know, a, a, extreme question. Uh, and Dukakis, instead of giving an emotional answer with the emotion that you, ex you would expect based on the question that was asked uh, about his wife, he just said, no, I would not support the death penalty, and then stop, talked about the statistics of why the death penalty was ineffective, almost like a robot with no emotion. And that, 
people, I think, were just, you know, like, a red, red alert, you know, something's not right here, you know, the, he was asked this question, and there's just no, no emotion on his face, he just immediately says, nope, and then talks about the, the statistics of why the death penalty was not effective, and I think he fell a lot in the polls uh, from that debate answer. So, a lot of blunders by the Dukakis campaign, you know, it seemed like they were on top of the world, uh, it was their election to lose, really, they had a huge lead in the polls, and they just had a bunch of blunders. So they ended up only winning 10 states plus D.C., which is a big improvement on the previous two elections for the Democrats, but still not nearly enough to win. Uh, but anyway, 1988 election. That is the last election of this video. Uh, all the elections subsequent to this, I don't think we're quite big enough to consider landslides. 1988 is honestly not, maybe not quite at the point of being a landslide, but it's definitely a strong victory for George H.W. Bush. Uh, so yeah, guys, that was this has been a look at the different landslides throughout U.S. history in U.S. presidential elections. Uh, so yeah, you know, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, thought it was interesting. Uh, you know, let me know you guys' thoughts in the comments. You know, if maybe one of these elections you didn't think it was quite a landslide, uh, you know, you can uh, talk about that. Or uh, maybe if there's an election you think I should have included here in here. For instance, you know, maybe an election like... Uh, 1996 or 2008. I didn't quite consider those elections to be landslides, but uh, maybe some other people would consider them landslides. Uh, but yeah, anyway guys, say once again, hope you enjoyed this video, thought it was interesting. If you like the type of content I make here on the channel about elections, electoral maps, polls, data analysis, all things elections really, uh, I think you should definitely subscribe to my YouTube channel, because I think you're going to really enjoy the content I've made here on this channel and the videos I make in the future. Uh, but anyway guys, once again, Hope you enjoyed this video, thought it was interesting, and I will see you in the next Election Center video. Bye!